Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Wasn't that beautiful in the um, in the waiting room while we we're in the lobby waiting? Just beautiful. Um, so up next, uh, something everybody's been waiting for, um, Gabor Mate. Gabor is a retired physician. And you know, many of you know this, but for 20 years, Gabor was a family physician, you know, had a family practice and, did, and had palliative care experience. But then he worked for decades in the downtown east side. Um, with patients who were challenged with drug addiction and mental illness. And from all of that experience, he, he began to write. And he uh, is the author of four books published in 30 languages. So many people talk about those books, especially in the field that you all work in. Internationally renowned speaker just mentioned to me a moment ago, he's gonna be doing an international gig coming up very soon. That's, that's interesting after the couple of years we've had. Um, and he's highly sought after to talk about addictions, trauma, childhood development, and relation, the relationship between stress and health. And today he's gonna to focus on mental health in schools. And what's gonna happen here is that um, uh, Dr. Mate is going to come on and do make a few opening comments and then I will join him. And mostly I'll facilitate uh, questions from you. So when I come back after um, Gabor has spoken to you for a while, I'll explain more about exactly how that's going to work. I will take questions from you. Um, so without any further ado, please welcome uh, Dr. Gabor Mate. Thank you, Maria. It's always a pleasure to work with you. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to speak to teachers. Just one quick note. If you, anybody knows my right eye being very red today, nobody beat me up. Uh, I seem to have burnt a blood vessel swimming this morning. So that's all that happened. Um, it's especially a pleasure for me to speak with teachers for two reasons. One is that I used to be a high school teacher myself. Some of you don't know this, but I taught high school for three years and I decided working with kids was way too stressful. So I went to medical school instead. And uh, the other reason is, is that uh, in our society, uh, kids spend more time in school than they do with their parents, which is completely unnatural. It's completely unnatural from the point of view of human development, because we evolved over hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of years in small band hunter gatherer groups where children were with their parents the whole day. And it was a completely different. And that's what we evolved. That was our evolutionary niche. Now, when civilization came on the scene, what we call civilization, um, 12,000 years ago, that started to change. So that the environment and with the rise of industrial capitalism it has changed even more. So that the situation where kids are away from their parents the whole day, and they're with other adults who are every year strangers to them is both unnatural and unprecedented. Now, the, press, the prevalence of, the, I'm not saying it's wrong, by the way, I just said it's unnatural and unprecedented. And we have to be aware of its implications and what that means. Now, within the last three weeks, there's been two major articles, one in the New Yorker magazine, the other is in New York Times, about the increasing suicide rate amongst children. And both the articles say that this is this mysterious trend. We don't understand it. But to my mind, there's nothing mysterious about it because the mental health of children has been increasingly um, unbalanced for over the last several decades. More and more children are being diagnosed with all manner of disorders from ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorders, reactive attachment disorders, anxiety, depression, and so on. And the medical model that I was trained in and that most physicians still follow is that what we're dealing with here are disorders of the brain and significantly genetically determined. That cannot be the case because if it was the case, the numbers wouldn't be going up because genes don't change in a population over 10, 20, 30, even 50 or 100 years. So if we're seeing something in greater um, preponderance, 
what it cannot be due to is genetics. Now, some people may argue that nothing is actually changing. We're just better at diagnosing things or we may, might be too keen to diagnose things. Well, there may be some truth to that, but it doesn't explain what's going on. It doesn't explain the increasing number of visits for suicide attempts to emergency wards. And it doesn't explain much of the trends that I'm describing. So if it's not genes where we're gonna find the answer, then where are we gonna find the answer? Now, unfortunately, uh, the parenting literature and the school systems in general, when they look at kids with these problems, they see behavior issues. So bullying is a behavior issue. And so the answer has been in many school boards, zero tolerance. Now, once in preparation for a book that I didn't get to write because I didn't have time on bullying with my friend Gordon Neufeld, I looked at the literature on the impact of zero tolerance policies on bullying. You know what the, there was an article that summed up all the research, you know what it said? Zero tolerance, zero evidence. So the zero evidence that trying to change kids' behaviors, either through um, positive incentives or particularly through punishment and social isolation does any good whatsoever. In fact, predictably, they create more problems. So I want to set aside any idea that we're dealing with behavioral issues here. Because those, what we have to look at is what's happening to kids. When kids act out, why did they behave the way they do? And I've often said this, take that phrase acting out. When I say acting out, the natural tendencies for your mind to imagine a kid who's being obstreperous, oppositional, rude, aggressive, disobedient. But consider the, I used to be an English teacher, so I pay a lot of attention to language. So consider the actual meaning of the phrase acting out. What does it actually mean? It means that we portray in behavior something that haven't, we haven't got the language to say in words. So in a game of charades, where you're by rule not allowed to speak, what do you have to do to convey the message? You have to act it out. Or if you land in a country where nobody spoke your language, and you had to portray hunger, you'd have to make some gestures indicating a desire to eat. So acting out then is representing in behavior something you haven't got the language for. We can respond by trying to inhibit the, the, the form of the message, which is the behavior, or we can get the message. What are the kids actually acting out? Now, what kids are actually acting out, I will maintain, and I, I say so backed by a lot of scientific literature, what kids are acting out are their emotional, psychological dynamics. So bully is acting out his or her or their lack of self-esteem and their need to dominate others you know, to feel better about themselves. Is the solution then to punish the bullying and, you know, zero tolerance? Or is it to provide that kid with a sense of self-esteem? What it all comes down to, and how did the child lose the self-esteem? And why did it not develop in the first place? Well, here's the thing. The human child and the brain of the human child develops in interaction with the environment. So even if we're to look at these various conditions like ADHD and anxiety or depression or oppositional defiant disorder as brain problems, we still have to ask ourselves, how does the human brain develop? Now, um, I will quote you two lines or two sentences from an article from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. This is the world's foremost child developmental study institute at Harvard University. And the article appeared in the journal of pediatrics 10 years ago now. Uh, pediatrics, the journal is the official journal of the American Pediatric Academy. 
I'm going to give you two sentences on brain development. The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. I'll go through that again. The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth. You know what that means? That means that already the child's experiences in utero have an impact on their brain development. And the more stressed mothers are, the more stress hormones get transferred to the baby through the placenta, the umbilical cord, that interferes with brain development. So if we're going to start looking at why so many kids are having problems, let's look at the stress on pregnant women in this society. Okay. Ongoing process that begins before birth continues into adulthood. And I'd like you to consider the um, implications of that statement, continues into adulthood. It means that the schools, whether they realize it or not, are not in the business of teaching mathematics or what year the Battle of Waterloo take, took place or who were the fathers of Confederation. They're in the business of constructing brains. Because if you construct brains that are good, the child will very easily learn mathematics, very easily have a curiosity about history. It will be a joy to teach. But fundamentally, what we, what we want is our healthy brains that are engaged with the world. That's your main job, I maintain. Especially since, as I said in the beginning, kids spend so much of their time in the schools. So to finish that sentence, continues into adulthood and establishes either a sturdy or fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Not some of the health, not some of the learning, all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. So the template for healthy learning and behavior and health itself is a brain that develops optimally. That's the first sentence, rich in implications. The second sentence is, the interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain not genes, the interaction of genes and experiences. Experiences turn genes on and off. It's experiences acting on a genetic potential that actually determines brain development. And you can have two kids with exactly the same set of genes, give them different experiences, they'll be two very different people. So the interaction of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. In other words, the biggest influence on the development of healthy brain circuits of incentive and motivation and curiosity, the capacity to acquire information, impulse regulation, empathy, compassion, connection with others, the biggest influence is the quality of adult-child relationships. Now, again, by that, they largely mean parents. But again, given that kids spend so much time away from their parents, from daycare onwards to their 18 years of age, graduate from high school, we're talking about the quality of adult-child relationships. And what I'm saying, therefore, is that the biggest um, contribution teachers can make to the healthy development of the, of the children is not just how good they are at the subject matter that they're trying to convey, but the quality of their relationships with the child. Because when the child feels connected with and safe, what happens is that the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that learns and can make decisions, opens up and is available. When a child doesn't feel understood and seen and validated and safe, that shuts down. And that child is not able to learn. Now, teachers cannot be responsible for the original template of what kids develop because that happens in a family of origin. But you have to understand 
that these kids with mental health issues and behavior problems, they are challenged because they haven't had the necessary conditions for healthy brain development. All right. I mentioned oppositional defiant disorder. I want to tell you how meaningless these diagnoses are. Diagnoses don't explain anything. Now, I myself have been diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. That happened in my 50s, and my first book was about that subject. In which I pointed out that this is not an inherited brain disease, that the tuning out and the absent mindedness are actually nature given coping mechanisms when there's too much stress. So if I'm stressed and I can't change the situation or escape it, my mind will tune out. But what happens when the parenting environment is stressed in the child's early years, when the brain is developing? In the first year of life, there are times when every minute, billions of connections are being made in the brain under the impact of the environment. So the more stressed parents are, the more stressed the infant is. The more stressed the infant is, the more they need to tune out when their brain is developing. So we're not dealing with the disease here. We're dealing with the response to the environment. If you want to help that child, we have to make them feel safe so they don't have to tune out. Oppositional defiant disorder, another one of these so-called diagnoses. Now, by the way, ADHD doesn't explain anything. So you might say, <clears throat> Gabor has ADHD. How do we know that Gabor has ADHD? Because he has two, because he tends he has a tendency to be absent-minded and he's got poor impulse control, which has been historically true about me, by the way. I've grown out of it, but I'm 78, you know? Uh, so Gabor has ADHD. Well, how do we know he's got ADHD? Because he tunes out and he's got poor impulse control. Why does he have poor impulse control and why does he tune out? He's got ADHD. How do we know he's got ADHD? Because he tunes out and has this poor impulse control. Why does he, you know, in other words, we haven't explained the thing, have we? We've described it, but we haven't explained it. The explanation is in the child's relationship with the environment. Oppositional defiant disorder. That's the diagnosis that's increasingly being made. We've got this disease or this condition called oppositional defiant disorder. That's the stupidest diagnosis in the whole world. It doesn't even exist. Not only doesn't exist in real life, it can't even exist in theory because it assumes that the child has a disorder. Now think about it, oppositionality. Can I be oppositional to somebody that I'm not in relationship with? If you don't know what I'm talking about, tonight when you go home or if you're at home right now, go into a room by yourself, shut the door, make sure there's nobody under the bed or behind the curtains and oppose somebody when you're by yourself. And if you succeed in doing so, for God's sake, put it on YouTube, because we all want to see how it works. Oppositionality, by definition, implies a relationship, doesn't it? And if oppositionality, defines, uh, uh, by definition, implies a relationship, why aren't we diagnosing the child's relationship with the adult world rather than diagnosing the child? So these kids who have the ODD traits, which describes how they behave, they behave that way because they don't have a good enough relationship with the adult world. They may not even trust the adult world. And maybe they've been pushed on too much by the adults with expectations and demands, so they're pushing back. That doesn't mean we don't have a real problem to deal with, but it means that we're barking up the wrong tree if we're trying to diagnose the child with this disorder. So I could explain anxiety or depression along similar lines. These are all responses to the environment. Now, teachers have an un unenviable or a very challenging job because on the one hand, you are tasked with delivering certain information to kids. But on the other hand, a lot of these kids are challenged, so they have difficulty uh, um, absorbing that information, even following the rules. What are you supposed to do? Now, here's where the problem in, I can tell you, lots of problems in medical education, 
most physicians wouldn't know what I'm talking about, even though the science is not even controversial. But I'm afraid that, that um, as far as I understand it, uh, pedagogic information, pedagogic education also leaves out any kind of psychological developmental understanding of the child, which is rather strange when you think about it, isn't it? You're dealing with these young creatures and we don't learn about how they emotionally develop. Now, why do I emphasize emotionally develop? Because the intellect is not in the lead, was in the lead of most of our lives and particularly children's lives are their emotions. As a matter of fact, if you look at brain development itself, the right side of the brain, which is the holistic emotional side of the brain, develops faster and earlier than the intellectual left side of the brain. Now, most of education is designed to appeal to the left side, intellectual side of the brain. But in fact, the right side is the template. And the edifice of um, intellectual learning and knowledge and awareness is built on a foundation of emotional balance. That's how human beings developed. We were emotional creatures long before we were intellectual creatures. And that's how a young human being also develops, that they're emotional creatures before they're intellectual creatures. So that schools need to pay a lot more attention to the emotional needs of children, as opposed to simply to their intellectual concerns that we have. By taking care of the emotions of children, we are ensuring that the intellect opens up and can absorb information. And this is especially true of the kids that are challenged by these so-called mental health diagnoses which actually are not diseases at all, they're problems in human development. Because development is everything. See, an acorn, if I had an acorn in my hand right now, that acorn has the potential to become a huge, beautiful, leafy oak tree. But it doesn't happen automatically. I'd have to plant it in ground that can support it. Irrigation, sunlight, minerals, earth to dig its roots into. Same with children. They need to have the right conditions to develop. This society deprives them, for all kinds of reasons, of their developmental needs. I'll be bold enough to mention my new book, which will be out in the fall. It's called The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And the case I'm making is that this culture is toxic to human development. The fundamentally emotional needs of children are fourfold. Number one, the uh, attachment relationship with the nurturing adults, secure attachment relationships. And given that teachers are in an in local parentis position, in, you know, in a place of parents, it also means secure attachment to the teachers, where the child feels safe, and understood and seen, and heard and validated. Number one, Number two, rest from having to work to make that relationship work. So the child's acceptance should not depend on how pretty they are, how smart they are, even how compliant they are. They shouldn't have to work to be accepted and understood. That doesn't mean we tolerate behaviors that are disruptive. We have to address them, but the question is, with what spirit, with what tone, with what emotion do we, do we address those behaviors? Believe me, when I was in family practice, I'd have adults in their 40s cry tears about something that a certain teacher said to them in a classroom. The teacher had no idea what impact their words had on that child. They just said something offhandedly sarcastic. 40, 30 years later, that person is crying in my office. Whenever never recall that. I'm just telling you, you have more power than you realize. Because children are so vulnerable. And even the hardened teenager is very vulnerable. So those are the first two needs. The third need is for children to be able to experience all their emotions. All their emotions whether it's um, joy or anger, sadness or grief. 
And the fourth need is free play out there in nature. Free play out there in nature. Play actually is essential for healthy brain development. There should be lots of play in the schools, lots of play. All animals play. We have circuits in the brain that are designated for play. You know why? Because we need them for healthy development. Cats play, um, lion cubs play, bear cubs play, dogs, puppies play. Human children need to play. And in our society, we've deprived them of play by burdening them with intellectual expectations before they're ready for it, and also through the gadgetry. This is designed to make kids addicted. And I can't emphasize for you the already available scientific literature. I can't emphasize it. I can't overemphasize it. That shows that gadgetry miswires the brain. So this is a daunting challenge because these are social trends that you as teachers are not responsible for, but you're made responsible for dealing with their impacts. With that challenge, I better stop talking because we only have 20 minutes or so left or even less. I do wish I had more time to speak with you and answer your questions, but um, that's modern life. So Maria, I'll stop here and let's take it from here. You can blame it on me. Okay, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of comments coming in, Gabber. Uh, people are picking up things that you're saying and appreciate appreciating them. And... Um, so just for a minute, I'll do a little bit of directions here. What we're going to do in this session is take uh, questions. Gabber likes to see your face, hear your voice. And so if you have a question, just go, I think you probably all know this, you've been on Zoom a bit, go down to reactions, the bottom of the screen, and just click on any reaction. I'll do it, but it's the hand raise, reactions. I don't see a hand raise in line, but let's just see it. Oh, there it is, raise hand. See, just like that, lower hand. And we'll try to watch. And when that happens, the, uh, the powers that be either will, will unmute you so you can ask your question. Maybe I'll, I'll be watching. One, I'm gonna make one comment only. Uh, this is, may seem self-serving, but it isn't. Um, those of you that are dealing with kids with attention problems, you should really read my book, Scattered Minds, which will explain to you like you won't find anywhere else. I say that. Uh, advisedly, but all of you, there's a book that I co-wrote called Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need To Matter More Than Peers. Now that's not my work. I helped to do with the writing, but it's a brilliant work of my friend and mentor, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, who is the leading developmental psychologist in the whole world as far as I'm concerned. He lives here in Vancouver. I say that totally advisedly. And uh, he lives here in Vancouver and Gordon understands children and children, how children learn like nobody does. So his website and that book and his DVDs are an unparalleled resource for anybody dealing with um, uh, troubled kids. I hope you listen to him. I hope you invite him to speak to you and I hope you'll do so many times because he's a bottomless fount of knowledge and information on child development. So we'll, just, we'll just, I agree. We'll just ask um, for that uh, link to Gordon Newfeld. just Google no Gordon Newfeld, but to maybe to put in the chat here. Um, thanks for that, uh, Gabber. All right, so um, I'm going to start from, I think it comes in order of people asking the question. So Monique Moore has a question. And Monique, just wait for a minute while, and you can take, you, you, Monique, can take your hand down now. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. A few steps here. Unmute and... We're good. We can hear you. Lower hand. Uh, hi, Gabor. Thanks so much uh, for, for sharing your wisdom this morning, and we sure look forward to reading your your new book this fall. Um, many, if not most of us are working with children that are, are profiling with the complex concerns that you shared. And um, could you give us some advice how to have those uh, or some recommendations, how we can have those delicate conversations with our families on how to reduce the stress level of the home environment um, of course, we have those conversations around devices, but any um, recommendations how to have those conversations with the families we work with? Yeah, thank you. So um, just a quick word about devices. I would, not allow, I would not allow a cell phone in the school. 
I just want all the cell phones. I think it's insane that kids carry their cell phones into their schools. They need to relate to each other and to adults, not to machines. Um, if I was advising parents, I tell them not to let them near these things for years and years and years and years, any more than you let them drink. This is more addictive than drink is, you know? You have to realize that. They're designed to be addictive by a neuroscientist. It's called neuromarketing, they call it. Now, in terms of the conversation with the families, what we have to realize here is that parents are doing their best. They're doing their best, but their best, just like I did my best, but my best was limited by the trauma in myself that I hadn't resolved. So I was passing on my trauma to my kids without meaning to. So are these parents, but they're not bad parents. They're the best parents they can be. So we have to approach them with a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding of the challenge they're facing and they don't understand their kids. And they, they live in a culture which is behavior oriented. So they think their kid's got a behavior problem or they're glad to get a diagnosis because, oh, this explains why my kid is that way. We have to really come alongside the challenge that the parents are facing and say, look, this is difficult for you. But consider that the biggest influence on the child is the emotional environment in the home for which the parents have to take responsibility. So how can I help you understand the child's emotional needs and what are your needs that need to be met? So you have to, I'm giving you a general approach that that, that has to be understanding of the parents' dilemmas and their likely traumatization. Uh, that doesn't blame the ch a parent, that, that delivers the information of the child's needs without making the parents feel blamed. That's delicate because parents are very defensive and they very quickly believe that they're being criticized when there's no critical intent. So the approach has to be very gentle very compassionate that the more you can deliver that to the parents the more they will approach the children that way that's my general response one of the uh, somebody just put into chat when people know better and have the resources and supports to do better they generally will yeah yeah um i have this conversation and, 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 so my... and just and just to complete that answer I begin any such conversation, not by talking to the parents, but by listening to the parents. I say, what's it like for you? You know, I start with that. Mm -hmm. The parent needs to feel that you're there on their side. And the thing is that, that so many of people online with us now are teachers. They're not counselors. They're not therapists. Yeah, well, and that's okay. You know, look, I've, I've talked to a lot of teachers and, and, and I've seen it. Um, some teachers, not because they heard this information from me or some any other code expert, but because they intuitively connect with kids, they're the ones that do a great job. They don't even realize why they're doing a great job, but they're doing a great job because they know how to smile at a kid, how to get down to the kid's level and say, hello, how are you today? Or, or, or just some little gesture of understanding and connection. Yeah. You don't need to be a therapist. You just need yeah. to be a human being that knows how to connect with the, with the child. Yeah, I wanted to say that. I, I, let me, let me tell you about my, my nephew or my grand, uh, my nephew-in-law. He's a teacher. And um, his, he told me once when he was a student teacher, um, kids would sometimes come up to him and say, hey, mommy. And he was, a bit, yeah. he was a bit confused by that. I said, Sam, they're giving you the biggest possible compliment because they're talking, they're, they're regarding you as a nurturing figure. He wasn't doing anything deliberately. That's just his nature. And they are so embarrassed when the children do that. I, I know that, <laughs> but yeah. they need not be embarrassed either. No. Uh, yeah. Cindy, um, and I was wrong about getting, removing your hand. You, just keep your hand leaving up until they remove it for you, if you know what I'm saying. Just come on screen, Cindy. Thank you. I think I'm on mute. Um, boy, I always ap appreciate having a chance to listen to you, Gore. And when you said uh, zero tolerance, zero evidence, you know, I, I was like, yes, yes, yes. And yet, you know, if you look at some common practice in our schools, 
we tend not to practice that very well. And I guess I am thinking here, and, and certainly there's a very strong interrelationship between mental health and substance use. And you've, you've spoken a lot on um, related to mental health and, and mental illness, but I'm, I'm curious if you can just make some, some comments that you think are helpful for folks and how we approach substance use as an, you know, and, and substance misuse as an opportunity to, to listen, to pull kids closer and not, you know, not further marginalize and or, well, maybe I'll be quiet and I'll, I'll turn it over to you if that's okay. Fair enough. So um, all addictions, whether they're substance related or not, are attempts to regulate the person's internal emotional states. In other words, I'm experiencing distress and I'm going to engage in some behavior, which could include taking a substance to not to feel the distress that I'm experiencing. So addictions and substance use problems are not isolated problems. They're the manifestations of a problem in that human being. So when I worked in the downtown east side all those years, every single one of my female patients had been sexually abused as a child. They had a lot of pain to escape from. There's a reason why our, our First Nations communities suffer so much addictions because they're the most traumatized segment of the population. I don't think I have to tell you why. There's a reason why 30% of the people in jail in this country are, origin, are Aboriginals, Indigenous people that make up 4% of the population. 50% of the women in jail in this country are Indigenous. They make up 4% of the population. Why? Because they have the most pain of any other group in this society. So the, my response to addiction is don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. So these kids that are engaged in substance use, they're using it to either feel more alive or to feel less pain or to connect with their peers. Why do they need that connection with the peers? Because they don't have the healthy connection with their adults. So in a very small nutshell, substance use is always an attempt to soothe internal distress. So rather than blaming the kid or, you know, this business of preventing drug use by telling kids that drugs are bad for them, you might as well give it up. The reason you might as well give it up because the kids who are listening to you don't need the advice because they're connected to you. And the people, kids who need the advice, they're not connected to you, they don't listen to you. That's why they're using. So the thing is to come alongside again and understand their emotional states and to appreciate what the drug is actually doing for them. Connection, numbing, peace of mind. Who doesn't want that? We need to validate what they're looking for and help them other ways to find it. That's it in a nutshell. And people are saying, Cindy, they love that you said pull children in close. Like it's not time out, it's time in. That's right. Yeah. In fact, in fact there's, a, there's a Canadian psychologist no longer alive, unfortunately, Otto Wen Wen Wenninger, who wrote a book called Time in Parenting. Mm. Ken, Kenneth Tupper, um, you'll be unmuted in just a second. And we'd love you to ask your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Gabor. Thanks for uh, your contributions. Always great to hear your perspective. Um, I, I was going to follow, it's something related to what Cindy was asking, but, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, the concern about sending the right message to youth about drugs and drug use has been a preoccupation. Uh, and I'm wondering with the changes that have been happening in the past number of years with respect to dealing with the toxic drug crisis, uh, things like decriminalization, safer supply, um, other initiatives that might be perceived as sending the wrong message. I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how school-based professionals can uh, sort of interface with youth to help them understand the kinds of shifts that are uh, taking place uh, in the context of this of this drug crisis. So you, mean, drug crisis. so you mean it might be confusing for a child to see drugs being decriminalized or made available to drug users under certain, is that what you mean? That's certainly been uh, uh, assertions by some people that, that these kinds of changes are sending the wrong message to youth. Yeah, those are the assertions by people that don't know what the heck they're talking about. They just haven't done the research. That's all. What can I help? I can't help them except show them to the research literature. Um, 
the kids don't use drugs because there's a supervised injection site on these tastings. Nobody says, hey, hey, I'm at a party and I can start injecting heroin because in downtown east side or, or, or take crystal meth or whatever, because downtown east side, there's some facilities. Nobody, that's not why kids get addicted or, 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 or get uh, recruited into substance use. It's for the reasons that I talked about. So the message that we give to kids, I said it's useless. The kids that listen to you they get it. They don't need the advice. But I'm not saying don't talk about them, but don't expect that giving the right advice will save the kids at risk. The kids who are at risk for drug use are the ones who are traumatized and troubled and, and ill at ease in their own skins. Giving them advice is not going to make any difference. Nor will it make it more likely that they use drugs because we have some sane, relatively sane policies in the downtown east side. So there's no correlation between the two. And I know, Kenneth, that they, some people make that argument, but the only people that make that argument that really haven't looked at the research. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And we have um, just a few minutes left, but there are two people with questions. Suki, do you want to take it away? You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, it's, I think Heather has to unmute her. Heather, yeah. could you unmute Suki? Just one minute, Suki, sorry. Um, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to hear you today again. And I really would like you to, to tell us more about healthy play across the ages. In my belief, adults need play as well. Would you talk more about what you see is healthy play? Well, healthy play is play that has no consequence, for one thing. It has no agenda except the process of engagement. So that it's not a question of who wins or who loses. It's a question of the fun that we're having. So there's no agenda there. Healthy play is also um, physical interaction without threat. Healthy play is simply giving free play, if you like, to imagination um, without evaluation. Healthy play is the sheer enjoyment of the other being that you're interacting with without wanting anything from them. Um, those are the qualities of healthy play. Now, if you want more resources on play, I can again recommend uh, Dr. Gordon Neufeld. And there's a late and great neuroscientist called Yak Panksep, P-A-N-K-S-E-P-P, -P, who actually distinguished, th that I mentioned earlier, there's a play circuit in our brain. And he's had brilliant writings on play. But those are the qualities of, 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 of healthy play. And I have to emphasize again, as human beings, we evolved out there in nature. We didn't evolve in schoolrooms. We didn't evolve inside buildings. We evolved out there in nature. Healthy play is built into our DNA. Healthy play in nature. So we should give kids lots of opportunity to be out there interacting with nature. Thanks, Suki. Janet, we don't have time for another question. Maybe you could put your question in chat and, and maybe um, Dr. Matei can respond to you. I'm sorry that we didn't have enough time for that. Again, blame me. And um, Gabor, as always, this has really it been very helpful. I've been watching the chat throughout. People are picking up on what you're saying. And for me, it, it conjured up a teacher that I had who made a difference. He wasn't a counselor. He was a, a literature teacher in grade 12, grade 10, who said something, one thing that made me feel, feel seen and it actually changed my life. So um, those are the people I hope everyone is thinking about right now and know that you are those people. And maybe you don't know that you are, but you are those people. No, if, um, I, if I'm but, the same area, every once yeah, in a while, yeah. every once in a while, some guy with gray hair, a woman with gray hair comes up to me and says, you don't remember me, but I was a student way back then. And, 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 and just something you said made all the difference in the world. And I'm sure that a lot of you who've been in the game old and long enough will have had those kind of experiences. You have no idea how powerful you are. And that goes both ways, depending on how you deploy that power. Thank you, Maria. Well, that's 
It's always That's a, a really powerful connection to make. Gabriel, we'll see you soon. Yes, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.